praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> every praise. Every praise. Young, old. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every praise is to our God. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we thank you. <laughs> we are delighted to be able to have such a good time, a Holy Ghost party, as it were. In your presence, there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand, there are treasures forevermore. Thank you that, Lord, you have given us the ability to open our mouth this morning. We're not laying in a hospital bed. We're not on a, a, uh, a respirator, God. We are able this morning to cry out unto you with the voice of triumph. <laughs> we are delighted this morning, God, that you have found favor. You have spoken favor and delivered favor unto us today. And it's all because you are so good. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just say thank you, Jesus. We thank you this morning. Thank you for our babies. Thank you for our teachers, God, that endeavor so long and hard. God, relentlessly pursuing perfection in our children, God. The ministry to children is so important to what we do. I thank you, God, that they recognize that this is the place where they can celebrate the existence of Jesus. And so I thank you today, Father, for your great grace and mercy. Father, this morning, we just worship you uh, in the name of Jesus. Can you sense his presence this morning? <laughs> glory, glory be to God in the highest. Uh, we worship you. We delight ourselves in you this morning. Welcome. We welcome the presence of the Holy Spirit, the living God in this place today. Come on, just lift your hands. You can remain seated. If you're seated, that's fine. If you're standing, that's fine. Just lift your hands and welcome the presence of the living God this morning. It is a place where God can have free reign and he is released to be God in our midst today. Among the congregation of the righteous. Hallelujah. Where would we be without Jesus? <laughs> oh, we would be lost. A ship without a sail. We would be lost without him. But he's here today. In the presence of you and I, join hands with somebody to your right or your left. Don't cross the aisle. Just join hands with somebody. Come on. I just sense the presence of God. I want to be obedient to that this morning. Father, thank you now in the name of Jesus. God, the hand that we hold, Lord, whether we know them or not, it is important, God, that we connect with them so that the flow of the Holy Ghost, the free flow of the channel of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, would flow into my brother or my sister this morning. They may be struggling in areas that I'm not even aware of, but God, because two or three are gathered together in your presence this morning, you promise to be in the midst. We welcome the promise and the presence of the Holy Spirit this morning. We're not ignorant of the devices of Satan. We declare that he would try to divide us, but he cannot do so because we are wiser than serpents. <laughs> Harmless as doves in the name of Jesus forth my love to my brother and my sister and I say to you receive receive the love of Jesus come on say that receive the love of Jesus this morning receive the love of Jesus this morning oh father we give you praise hallelujah if you agree with that prayer can you say amen? God bless you take your seated Take your seats. I want to I want to welcome our YouTube audience this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are LifePoint Christian Faith Center located at 1221st Avenue in the city of Corville, Iowa. We're at the corner and intersection of 1st Avenue and I-80. And we're so delighted that you have tuned in and decided that you want to join us. We welcome you down. We've got a warm seat of welcome here for you whenever you come down. And we'd love to have you here if you're in the local area. Take time to visit us. We do meet on Sundays at 10 a.m. We also meet on the first Sunday of the month. Matter of fact, that will be this evening at 5 p.m. And we always have a great time. Come as you are. There's no requirement for how you dress. Come ready to receive from God. If you're not in the local area and you just tuned in via YouTube or some other channel, we welcome you. Get something to write with. We invite you to just open your hearts to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that you could hear his voice so that another you will not follow. We also welcome our first time guests today. Would you give our audience and our first time guests a great big warm of what warm Hallelujah. I also, while I'm up here, I want to mention that we do have Men of Honor Breakfast coming next Saturday. This coming Saturday at what time? 8.30 a.m. right there in my local home. So come on, join us. We are at 18. 
to Northridge. We invite you in. Amen. Glory to God. You guys look so wonderful. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Did everybody have a Merry Christmas? Happy New Year, as they say. I don't know how you define that, but, you know. With our grandkids, we had our grandkids come over and spend the night on New Year's Eve, Bishop Apostle, and uh, boy, that Dominic, his foot is in my ear when he sleeps with me and my wife. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So we're delighted. But we had a great time, and I and, uh, hope you did as well. It's good to see you in 2019. Amen. Yes. Isn't it a great time to be alive? It should be. Yes. And we're not afraid of the future, but we're delighted in who God is and what he's spoken over our future. Can you say amen to that? <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for your careful attention for the next few minutes um, as we just continue on. We've been talking the Spirit. I'm not going to deviate from that. But I want to, uh, just as I listen to the Lord this morning, I want to talk about, and I'm going to start at Matthew 24. So, gentlemen, this is not in your notes, but if you would turn, or ladies, whoever's back there, Matthew 24. I invite your attention there, Matthew 24. And we're going to talk about the first fruit of the Spirit called love. It is an all-encompassing fruit. As truth is understood, you can understand that all of the other fruits are summarized inside and contained inside the fruit of love. And the fruit of love, I heard one, one uh, writer say, is like with many segments or a grapefruit with many segments. It's contained in one skin, as it were, but there are many sections to it. And so with that, the fruit of love is important to our success. As a matter of fact, from Matthew 24, if you have it, I'm going to read it from the, from the expanded Bible. Jesus is talking here, and he says, there will be more and more evil or sin, lawlessness in the world. So most people will stop showing their love for each other. The love of many or most will do what? Grow cold or die, some translations say. But those people, verse 13, who keep, who keep their faith, endure, stand or firm, stand firm or persevere until the end will be saved. Isn't that interesting? Those people who keep their faith. So we see the connection between love and faith. Amen. And we already know that's true. But the good news about God's kingdom, verse 14, is good news will be preached in all of the world. Right. As a testimony to every nation, then will the end come. So what you begin to see is that love or the, the, the absence of love or the deterioration of love precedes the coming of the Lord. And many of us, we want to we don't not we don't like being in a loveless society, for lack of a better term. But the reality of it is it's a good time to be alive, because when you see the love of people deteriorating, it means that Jesus is soon to come. Isn't that what we're living for? Right? For the coming of the Lord. It's imminent. And we talk about it. And we, you know, I was, uh, my wife and I had <clears throat> occasion this couple, this past week to visit with a couple different people and, and to uh, just spend time. And one of the things that we collectively agree on is that in our society today, there is an absence of love. And we toss the word around so much. In one case, I can say that I love my wife, but then I turn around and I love my pizza. You know, we've got a, <laughs> my wife, look at me. We've, we've got a prolific teacher that comes here quite often, and she'll tell you, you know, you don't love things, you love God. Come on now. And so when we so casually throw the word around, it becomes less significant and less important to us. And so what we've got to understand that Jesus gave us commandments in regards to what we should love. One of the things we love is we should love the Father, the Lord, thy God, with partial. Yeah, I thought you knew that. Yeah. With all of our heart, which can be translated as strength. With all of our strength, we are to love the Lord. And then Jesus comes and he says, I give you a new commandment. What? Love one another as I have loved you. Not even as yourself, but I have loved you. Because, see, he loved us in such a way, and we talked about this the last time when we, when we taught on this, he loved us in such a way that was clearly, it's, it's, it's just uncomprehensible. 
principle, excuse me, for our minds to recognize how somebody could choose to love you as dirty and filthy as you were. And truth be told, a lot of us are still dirty and filthy in our minds, but not in our spirit. Come on now. We, we focus on the, the inconsistencies and the, the, the lack in our soulish realm, and it causes us to think that we're not worthy of that love. I wish I could have some help this morning. Because, see, what I have to understand is that what happened in the spirit realm over my life is greater than what my natural realm is going through right now. And if I can't somehow or another renew my mind to the reality that I have been, I have been received into the kingdom of God through the blood sacrifice of Jesus which took away my sin, then I will have a struggle fulfilling the destiny that God has over my life. In other words, what I will do is I will think somehow or another that I'm not qualified to do what God has already qualified me to do. Mm. Okay. And what happens is, what, the reason why that struggle is there is because we have bumped up against people who do not understand the true concept of love. Are you hearing me this morning? So I want to talk to you this morning about the fruit of love, and I want to talk to you from the standpoint, and I'm going to, I'm going to approach it this way, uh, what love is versus what love is not. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Now, we're still talking from the, from the as, as 2018. I know we're in a new year, but that doesn't change anything. But we're talking about the learning, the potential in every seed. So I invite you to turn to Galatians 5 with me this morning. Would you do that? Galatians 5. Verse 22, and I'm going to read this from the Living Bible. And I'm going to talk to you about what love is, love is not, just, just a little while. And uh, give, me, uh, give me 40 minutes, please, if you would, on the clock. What love is versus what love is not. Galatians 5, what did I tell you, turn? Thank you. 22, some people, some people still. Focusing in, coffee hadn't kicked in yet, caffeine hadn't really hit you yet, but that's okay, we'll wait on you. From the Living Bible, verse 22, but when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit in us. Now, do you first notice that it is not you producing fruit? Many people struggle with that because they think somehow or another, I need to do this, I need to do that, but his presence in you produces the fruit. Now, there are certain qualifiers for that. We know this. One of, one of the qualifiers is that I have to be obedient. Yes. I have to be sensitive. I have to be yielded, right? So he will produce this kind of love. Say love. love. Joy. Joy. Love. Peace. Peace. Patience. 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 Kindness. kindness. Oh, wait a minute. That does say kindness. Gentleness. Good, yeah, gentleness. I'll get to that in a minute, but gentleness, translation says. Goodness, faithfulness. Verse 23 says gentleness and self-control. There is no conflict with Jewish laws. That's important. That's why I chose this translation. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ have nailed, one translation says crucified, right? Have nailed their natural evil desires to his cross and crucified them there. In other words, the inference is you cannot belong to Christ. You cannot say that I am a child of God. You cannot say that I am baptized in the blood of Jesus. You cannot say that I am born again. You cannot say that I am his child without understanding that your natural evil self has already been nailed to his cross. Amen. Now, that, that may not be significant to this church because, you know, we've been teaching all these lives for many years. But you have to understand how we grew up. That was something that we had to, they, they told us that we had to do every day, nail our flesh to the cross. Yes. And in trying to, and attempting to nail your flesh to the cross every day, stay with me now, I know full well that the mindset of mankind is that you will never find a way where everything that you want to be nailed there is actually on there. And you will struggle your entire Christian life in thinking that you are not good enough because you have not done enough to be worthy of what he said has already been done. And so we have to understand this is not a physical, soulish realm. The, the, the word eros, uh, which is another, another type of love in the Greek, which is that physical love is not sufficient to be able to get you to understand how much God, through Jesus Christ, showed you his love. The Bible says that he commended his love towards us while we were yet sinners. 
sinners, Jesus died for us. Let me give you, see if I can give you a brief example. As much as I love my wife and I love my son, there are two different manifestations of love between us. Isn't that right? He said, praise God. Amen. So with that, though, with that understanding, I can only love her to a point of her own recognition that I am here for her no matter what we go through. But I do not have enough love or the capacity of enough love in me to be able to nail myself to a cross for her to get her to be convinced that Jesus loves her. In other words, I can't be God for her. And many of us have struggled in our realm because we've tried to be God for somebody else. And it's not because we've wanted to be many times, but because they have demanded that somehow or another, I want you to make me happy. And God never really called us to be happy. I better move over here because I ain't getting much. He called us to be happy, but he did call us to be content. He did call us to be satisfied with understanding that his love never fails. It has no limitation. And his mercies, like we talked about last weekend, are new when? Every morning. So what is he doing? He's positioning us, on a, positioning us on a platform that we can recognize that the reason why we sense love, not feel love, is because love has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. But without the Holy Ghost, you have no capacity to know love. So why is it that people think that we can do this without the Holy Ghost? And so what we do is we go out and we become forceful in our approach to other people instead of being loving to say God loves you just the way you are. Can you say amen to that? So he says, verse 25, let me go on down. If we are living now by the Holy Spirit's power, let us follow the Holy Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Sounds simple enough, right? That we be led by the Spirit. We talked about this. Let me read this from the same portion of Scripture from the Expanded Bible. But the Spirit produces the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, right? Or faith, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law that says these things are wrong, right? Those who belong to Christ Jesus have, have crucified their own sinful selves or the sinful name, given up their old selfish feelings. Please, please make a note of that. They have given up their old selfish feelings and the evil things they wanted to do or their desires or passions we, verse 25 says, get our new life from the Spirit so we should follow or be guided by our walk in step with the Spirit. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13, please. See, love, love is, um, <laughs> yeah, 1 Corinthians 13. Love is and has been so misunderstood in our society at large, and it's actually come, I won't say crept in, because it seems like it's you know, take a, taking a great big leap into the church. But the church is the proving ground, for lack of a better term, of love. It's where we prove it, not just talk about it. When I go to Walmart, my wife asked me to go to Walmart last night after I had already gone to Walmart once in a day. And I don't mean no harm, but once in a day is more, just about more than I can stand. I don't mean no harm. I don't mean no harm. I don't mean no harm. And she asked me to go back again, and I told her I'm not going back until here. I set a parameter. And the reason why I did that is because I knew that when I walked in Walmart, see, my mission is get in and get out. <laughs> That's my mission. I, I'm not trying to talk to nobody. I ain't trying to bump into no saints. I ain't trying to talk. Him. I look. I ain't trying to bump into no ain'ts. <laughs> you know those people. You know, those people that you know. Hey, pastor. Wait, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. We bumped into a lady. I, she may be watching. Forgive me. You may not know who you are. You not. We bumped into a lady the other day before Christmas. Uh, and this is a good story. So just stick with me. Uh, and. Bro, I couldn't remember her name. And I didn't want to take time to ask. Because to take 
because I got to talk. I'm just saying, I'm in Walmart, okay? Y'all got to get the context. I'm just in Walmart. And when she, hey, pa and she said this, hey, Pastor Tommy, Pastor Lynette. I'm like, oh, God, help me. Because I don't know your name. She's been through the doors of Life Point before, and I ain't seen her in years. We, it's been years. It ain't been months. We ain't seen her in years, okay? And so my wife and I were kicking it around, and I think we even talked to our nephew, you know, and we were like, well, you know, I'd have said no. I, no, I said no. If I had said forgive me, what is your name? Then that meant I would have had to talk. And I wasn't trying to engage in conversation. Okay, I got spirit. Are you, are you feeling me? I'm trying to get in and get out, okay? So I didn't want to do that. So we, we moved on, we chatted, you know, and I'm not one for small talk. And then, you know, so we kicked it around a little bit. Finally, we just resolved, you know what? Whatever, we don't know her name. We can't remember her. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, isn't that something? Yesterday, I went to the post office. And sure enough, she was right there, but she walked in behind me. And I'm like, Lord Jesus, help me. I didn't say it out loud. I just said it to myself. I'm like, Lord, what are you trying to tell me here? And it was clear that she didn't want to talk to me either. Are you feeling me? Now, <laughs> oh, I'm just throwing that in there, but... <laughs> But my point is, I can love her without having to know her. Are you feeling? So I ain't gotta, I ain't gotta be living in your house. Of you, matter of fact, it's probably better that I don't live in your house. <laughs> Y'all don't want me coming over to your house. You know good and well. You don't, cause then you got to put on this spiritual face and all this kind of stuff. And you're like, well, I wasn't really expecting you to come over, Pastor. I was just. <laughs> I was just saying hello, you feeling me? But, but with the understanding of what God is attempting to do, what God wants us to do is engage. Because without my ability to communicate my love, then you really don't know who I am. And so what happens here, let me keep, so, so what happens here is what God does is he demonstrates by example and by demonstration how much he loves us by not just sitting in heaven and saying it, but sending his only begotten son and showing it. Isn't that right? Let's keep going. You all right? Verse, verse one. If I had, not that you do have, but if I had, say if I had. Paul writes here, again, I'm reading from the Living Bible. The gift of being able to speak in other languages without learning them <laughs> and could speak in there is in all of heaven and earth but didn't love others I would only be making noise That's right. yep. That's right. yep. hmm. verse 2 if I had not that I do have but if I had the gift of prophecy everybody is prophetic nowadays I don't know how we got there but everybody's prophetic some people are pathetic and they confuse it with prophetic. But if I had the gift of prophecy and knew all about what's going to happen in the future or knew everything about everything, some folks that know everything about everything and ain't got no gifting at all. We call them know-it-alls. But didn't love others, what good would it do? Even if I had the gift of faith so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move. Isn't that right? I would still be worth nothing all without love. Verse 3 says, if I gave everything I have to poor people. Jesus never called you to give everything you have to poor people. And if I were burned alive for preaching the gospel, but didn't love others, it would be of no value whatever. Painting such a picture here to let them know because what listen now he's writing to the church at Corinth and he's getting them to understand now remember we've studied this before Corinth versus Galatia and what is happening is the church at Corinth has been so despicable and so 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 evil and so irreligious now when they hear the truth they want to jump in with both feet and they want to be all of these things that Paul said they can be how many of you want to do everything that you can for God how many of you want to be so obedient to God that God will use you in a big time way? Come on, there's not enough of y'all raising your hands. Y'all don't want to be used by God? So with that, though, the Corinthian church, when they 
want to do all of these things that Paul said you can do, like all of us or most of us, but what they did not realize is you cannot do it without love. The absence of love makes it a chore and a law. And Galatians, over in Galatians, he says that there's no, there's no law that can circumvent. Isn't that right? Let's keep going. You all right? Verse 4 says, love is very patient and kind. Let's go through this for a minute because that's the topic of what I want to talk about, learning the, uh, excuse me, what, I, what love is versus what love is not. Love is very patient, so love is not impatient. You get touchy with people. I told my wife I was talking to, we went and visited with Reverend Butler and his wife the other day and we were sitting there talking and forgive me, forgive me, pray for me, forgive me. Pray for me, forgive me, pray for me. But I told him I'm not very patient anymore with people. Forgive me. I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me. But I also understand that I have to be very patient if I'm going to be able to be successful in the kingdom of God. And yet people's, people's lack of commitment or people's lack of, of, of submission or giving or love for God, whatever you want to call it, causes me sometimes to feel impatient. Rob and I ask them, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Because I've got to be very patient if I'm going to walk in the full manifestation of love. Oh, y'all ain't never been there. Some of y'all so patient. Come on now. You know, and I'm going to tell you where patience kicks in or does not kick in the best. You don't really know any you live with them. So I can be very patient with you and be very impatient with her because I don't live with you. All I got to do is see you once, twice a week. You know what I'm saying? And you're going to be gone. I better, talk, I better talk to this side because y'all ain't saying that. Love is very patient. How long y'all been married? Be 53 in April. Good answer. Good answer. That's detail. You know that. Because if you had said 52 and a half, she'd have said no, 53 in April. But you really don't know how much you love somebody till you live with them for over 20 years. Amen. Get a roommate and see how well your, your, your love walk kicks in. Say very patient. And kind. Patience without kindness really doesn't work a whole, you know. <laughs> Woo, kindness. Kindness. You know, a manifestation of kindness to me is just saying thank you. Uh, a manifest, manifestation of kindness, and I know it's tough in the Midwest because, you know, we got, we got Iowa-grown girl. Pull your religious toes in. Do I still need to say that after all these years? And, and, and if you're an Iowa-grown girl, you may not be used to somebody, some man opening the door for you, but it's still kindness to be able to do that. It don't mean you got less muscle tone. You might have more muscle tone than... than it don't mean that you're not capable of grabbing the door, but somebody's just trying to show you kindness. Kindness is a manifestation of God's activity in that person's life. Yeah. That didn't go over very well. I better keep going. <laughs> Verse 4 says, it's never, je never jealous or envious. Jealousy. You know, there's, there's this thing. There's this thing that, that I've noticed since I've been shepherding. I've noticed more now. And that is that people are jealous. And, and in a sense that um, they look at what other people have, but they don't want to put the work in to get what they have. They would rather be spiritual and say that that's not God to have it than do the work to get it. So if, if, in other words, if I live in a, when I live in a better house than I'm living in right now, because the house, my wife and I recognize the house we live in is small. So when I live in a better house and it has six bedrooms as opposed to, we got now three, four, three. And people say, well, you know, that's that prosperity preacher it is a manifestation of jealousness or jealousy 
because they simply will not use their faith to get what God has given us because we put in the work. But yet they call themselves children of God. And so then we wonder why the church is impotent because we have those, not in this church, but in many churches we have those people sitting up in our midst and they, instead of adding to or supplying to, uh, the Bible says that we, we, each one of us should supply, every joint should supply something to the kingdom, to the cause. And then you've got people that, that are pulling away because their mouth shows forth what's really going on in their heart. And so they put their mouth on you because you live in a nice house that built. And they were not willing to build the house, but they certainly are willing to talk about the house. That's jealousy or envy. Can you say amen? amen? Glory to God. It says that love is not boastful or proud. My daddy, our daddy used to have a saying said that I'm godly proud. You know, back in the day, I didn't really gravitate to it. I heard him and I understood it. I thought I understood it. But I understand. But the Bible says that if I'm going to make a boast, I should make a boast in who? In the Lord. Because I recognize that there's nothing that I have. There's nothing that I have. Nothing. Nothing that I have that I got on my own. If I'm healed, I'm healed by his stripes. Huh? If, I, if, if I'm a good businessman or good business one, woman, it's because his wisdom is operating in me. If I'm prosperous, if I'm prophetic... If I have the ability to teach, preach, or reach, it's because of his goodness in my life. Isn't that right? So if I'm going to boast, I can't make a boast in Tommy Roberts. I ain't got nothing to boast in. But I make my boast in. But the, but the Bible says these are the things that love is not. It's not boastful or proud. Verse 5. Are you still with me? Yes. Never haughty. <laughs> haughty. High-minded. Thinking more of yourself than you ought to. Romans 12. Verse 2, I believe it is. That a person should not think more of themselves than they really are. You know how, you know, you know, you know this, this has, I better step up here. Can I step up here without a squealer? Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to give you a good example of this. Pull your religious toes in. Are they in? How much time I got? Uh, haughty goes on two, you think of it one way, but it goes both ways. It goes two different ways. One way of haughty is, is being arrogant conceited, uh, self-absorbed. But another way of haughty is being self-deprecating, thinking of myself less than. Another, I'm just not worthy. Actually, that is a manifestation of pride. Uh, Dave says to me, but, Dave, but Max says, Pastor Tommy, and he, he said this, so I'm going to use it. I love you, man. Well, brother, you just love the Lord. Well, I knew that going in. I, I, oh, okay. I started to say something else, but if I say something else, they might get a little upset. Can I say it? I knew that, fool. You didn't have to tell me that. Yeah, I love the Lord, but I was trying to heap a, a compliment on you. Why can't you just take it? Why can't you just receive it? Well, you know, brother, don't love me, love the Lord. That's true. But, but I, 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 de <laughs> I defeat the intent of his word of love towards me by somehow or another feeling, well, you know, I'm just not worthy. I am worthy because Jesus made me worthy. And I get it because I recognize that you do indeed what you love is the God in me. Help me somebody. And so we, we have two sides of this thing that have to be understood because if we're going to really receive the good, good, rich blessing of this fruit, we've got to recognize both sides. And so how do we recognize both sides? Holy Ghost. Say Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Never haughty. Selfish. <laughs> Selfish. Selfishness. 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 Withholding from others that which is the plan or the desire of God for them. And it is in your, within your ability to do it. 
I'm trying to say that again. Selfishness, withholding from others, that which is the plan or desire of God for others, and it is your, it, within your ability to do it. Matter of fact, the Bible says that we should absolutely not do that. In other words, we should be more concerned about the people or the, the, the household of faith and giving to the necessity of them than withholding because you know what? Well, you know, they should have their financial house better, better together better than that. I work hard for my money. <laughs> I work hard for my money. Let them get their own. Well, we just talked about, you know, all of the things that go into love. Love means that you're not going to withhold from others you need. Can I, can I give you, let me, let me give an illustration, see if I can fix this, because y'all ain't saying nothing right now. But, but if I look at Jesus from the standpoint of love, he did not need to come to the earth to save us. Not need. Listen to me now. Listen to my terminology. He didn't need to do it. He chose to do it. He chose to do it, because, listen, because of the desire of the Father. And I can dare say, maybe some of y'all can correct me, those of you that are smarter than I am, that the Father actually had a need, a need for love to be manifested. And the only one that could fulfill it was Jesus. Because why create mankind if all you're going to do is banish them from the garden? So obviously he had a need. God help me. Oh, turn Miles so the camera can see him. Okay. <laughs> this young lad does not know what his papa needs. Hi, boy. He doesn't know what his papa needs. Are you feeling me? But in his, in, his, in his maturation and his understanding, he will come to know that his papa's and his Mimi's desire is, stop calling me grandpa, by the way. <laughs> just thought I'd throw that in there. And grandma, I'm just saying, y'all can be that, we papa and Mimi, okay? <laughs> but as he matures, he will begin to understand that his papa and his Mimi's one desire is to see souls saved and to shepherd them correctly. In that understanding, what he begins to understand that his papa needed, God help me this morning, needed to stand before people and preach. Needed to be able to be long-suffering, patient, not haughty, not high-minded, to be self selfless in his love. And when he understands the need, then he can do something about it. Jesus understood the need of the Father and then he could do something about it. That's why you and I sit here today. Isn't that right? So understanding that, what you have to recognize is that God will use you and I many times to fulfill somebody else's need. Ah, God. And what we think in our mind and our thinking is we think, well, I don't have enough. But love, the Bible says, love never fails. So if I, if I give what I have, Paul said, if I do all these things without love, then I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. But if I give what I have in love and I'm inspired by God, I've heard God, I've been obedient to God, I don't care about the amount, but the amount will go toward meeting the need. But everybody needs love. Are you all right? What verse did I leave you at? Five? Love does not demand its own way. There are people that come into the house, you know, and I'm, I'm just going to say it because I'm almost out of time. And <laughs> there are people that, the, not everybody, listen, 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 listen. Let me, let me, let me, let me get off. I'm going to get on a rabbit. I'm going to chase a rabbit right now. I'm going to chase this rabbit. Okay? In chasing this rabbit, y'all going to have to pull in your religious toes because I'm just going to let it flow, let it rip, let it go. Now, understand this. The church, as we know it, as an institution, is deteriorating every day. 
Close your Bibles. I'm going to end here because I can hear. I, close your Bibles. Close your Bibles. Close your notebooks. <laughs> Woo, Jesus. Glory to God. Help us, Lord, this morning. And because the church is shrinking. Now, I'm not giving a negative statement. Some of you say, well, that ain't faith. No, I'm telling you what is going on so you can be intuitive and perceptive enough to be able to see it. Are you hearing me this morning? And because of that, what is happening, because this has prophetically already been established, God never finishes anything, until I mean, starts anything until it's already finished. And so the makeup and the constitution of the church has changed. Whether we want to embrace it or not, whether we want to think that somehow or another, well, you know, this church should be this way and this church should be that way. You have to be a new church and a new entity in the power of the Holy Ghost in 2019. And in 2019, you're going to have to change your mind about the way you approach people, about the way you approach church. You're going to have to allow the Holy Ghost to change who you are from the inside out. You're going to have to be turned into another man. Are you hearing me this morning? And, and so what happens is we think that all of the church experiences that we had will define where we're going. And it just is not so. Because you have never seen anything like what God is going to do in your life, in our lives. You haven't seen it. The blueprint has not been made. Oh, God, help me this morning. What, 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 what are you talking about? Well, because what happens is God doesn't need a brick and mortar structure to be God. His choosing to be God starts with what happens in the inside of my life. Help me somebody. He doesn't respect your persons. He chooses this man just like he chooses this woman. He don't care about what you look like, baby. All he cares about is the soil of your heart prepared for what he wants to do in a new season and a new era in your life. But if you don't recognize that love is the first factor you will try to keep this thing for yourself and you will just come to a place of worship and not tell people, do you know that Jesus is soon to come? And we've heard it so much that it just kind of, it just kind of drifts over us. You know, what's that old saying? You just get dull of hearing. Somehow or another forget that this thing is real, baby. And so what we see, we see churches, listen, sit down. We see churches that have these great, big, huge, just my God, what they call mega churches. Yeah. 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 Get it. I think I want one. I don't know. <laughs> he said, I don't. But, but the reality of it is this. I don't care how many people are sitting in the seats. It is not based on the number that are in the seats. It is a based on what is going on in the heart of the person that occupies the seat. I need you to know that God loves you. I need you to know that God will use you in ministry just like he uses me. I need you to know that it doesn't matter what color, what age, what gender. I need you to know that God loves his people. And I know that God wants you to tell everybody, whether they be a, a, a woman on the street a gay man, a homosexual, homosexual, it doesn't matter. He needs them to know. And so what is happening is the landscape of Christianity is changing. And so Paul writes this from a standpoint of saying, listen, you Corinthians understand this. You don't nobody want you, baby. Can, can I tell you that don't nobody want you? That doesn't make you worthless. It just makes you, makes you have to have an understanding. They don't want me. The only one that wants me is the one who died for me. And so what we, what we start doing is we start getting this, 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 this uh, stilt slanted viewpoint of what God really wants from us. My God, he don't need your money. You ain't got enough of it. I don't have enough of it. Oh, God, help me. Somebody said, well, he wants my prayer. No, he don't. He got angels that fly around, cherubims, seraphims. He's got the head 
that whenever the king of glory shows up, my God, there's this, there's such a rattle and, a, and, and, and such a broadcast in the heavenly realm that somehow another it shakes the heavenly realm. May not shake the earth, but it shakes heaven and says that the most high is on his throne. He can get praise from a rock. He can get praise from a waterfall. He can get praise from a tree. And he can get praise from a fish. But he don't need your praise. But you need to give it to him. <laughs> it is more beneficial for us to do the things that God has called us to do rather than somehow or another sit back and say that, well, you know, I'm not, it's, I'm insignificant or I'm not worthy. So as, as the church changes, the people have to change with the church. And so in changing with the church, what we see then is we see a descriptive, and, and I, I'm way off my notes, but that's okay. You, you know, we see a descriptive that makes it necessary, necessary, come, and, 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 and on Monday through Saturday, be more concerned about the entity of the church than what I am on Sunday. Sunday my, my Sunday routine is usually pretty, pretty straightforward. You know, I get up in the morning. I've prepared Sunday, Saturday evening. I get up in the morning. I say my prayers, do my devotion, do whatever my time with God is. And I, I begin to focus my mind on the calling of God on my life, the message that he has at hand. He quite often changes it, and that's fine. And I'm ready to give God what I have. But in giving God what I have on Sunday, it is not the Sunday experience that defines what will cause the church to be all that it's called to be. It is what I do on Monday through Saturday as, as I live my life publicly in front of other people. And if, 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 my, if my faith does not pro provide me enough confidence to say, you know what, sister, brother, man, guy, girl, hey, who are you? What do you do? What's important to you? you? Worship? Who do you worship? And I don't do those things. There will never really be dramatic change in the lives of others, nor will be there, there be dramatic change in my church because my church is dependent upon my profession of my faith. The Bible says to hold fast to the what? Profession of your faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And, 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 and help me, Lord. I'm, I feel like I'm out here on a limb. And <laughs> the confession of my faith means that I am unashamedly the son of the most high God. I'm born again, y'all. When I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus. I can't wait to be reunited with my daughter my mama, my daddy. I can't wait to meet my grandmas again. I can't wait to see some of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm going to bump into some people that I didn't think would make it into heaven. There's going to be a whole lot of them. And then, then for some of the folks that I thought I would see, they ain't going to be there. And I'm thinking, where y'all at? But that's the confession of my faith. The profession of my faith, however, takes on a dynamic that has to be understood. The profession of my faith means that I will stand in front of other people. At work, at the gym, at the grocery store, no matter where I'm at, and say, you know what, I am unashamedly a child of God. And, 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 and I don't know all of the Hebrew and Greeks then. I don't know all of the context and the pre subtext but I do know this that God changed my life and because he is real in me I want him to be real in you and if you can't get that I'm not going to condemn you because you choose your same lifestyle I'm just going to tell you that I am going to tell you this is who God is to me Boy, I, I, I. <laughs> glory to God. Glory, glory. 
See, in being selfish, we don't intend to be selfish. We just are. Because it's like, I'm going to get mine. You get yours. I worked hard. I worked for 20 years, 25 years. I worked till I was 65 and I got my retirement. 1K and I made good investments and everything and that's all well and good but then the person sitting next to me has come is, is, is currently living on food stamps and I can't help that because that wasn't my fault well nobody said it was your fault but it cannot it, 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 it won't be your fault but it can be victory it can be your deliverance it can be your ability to help somebody else and if the church doesn't take on that mindset then we remain selfish Everybody in church is not supposed to have the same economic, socioeconomic status. Just not. It says in the the book of Acts, in the first century church, that they had all things common. Now, I know that's that's a crazy concept for a westernized mind. Very, very foreign. But, But when God looks at us, is he looking at us from a position of us being in love with him and his concepts or what the world says we should, you know, do with our own stuff. I don't know. I'm just asking. I sent a, I sent a text message this morning, you know, asking about what love looks like for each one of us. And, and I, I can't answer the question for you, but you have to answer the question for yourself. Rest assured, the question must be answered. Hmm. Verse 6 says, love is never glad about, don't turn it. Glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. If you love someone, you will be loyal to him, no matter or her, no matter what the what the cost. You always believe in them, always expect the best of them, always in defending them. You can read verses eight through eleven, or we'll read them next time. Third thirteen. I read a story the other day. I communicated to my wife as we as I was just I was just browsing. I wasn't really. I was in my office trying to catch up on some things and was able to do that. And uh, I wrote a story about a gentleman by the name of Terry Harrington. Anybody know who that is? Anybody heard of Terry Harrington? I'm not surprised by that because he's really not that, very, that famous. And uh, in listening to uh, and reading about the life of Terry Harrington, we were driving in a car, I said there's a lot of similarities between his life and my life. And love, ladies and gentlemen, takes on many different manifestations. I'm going to tell you that right now. It does. It really does. Um, What you think is insignificant many times is the best thing that you can do. It's just sending the thank you card, just sending the... The, the text saying I'm thinking about you. I do that often. I don't, I, you know, there's too many people in my circle that I can remember all their birthdays and, and send notes to them and all that kind of stuff. I don't even try to do that. But whenever the Holy Spirit just kind of prompts me or leads me, I try to make sure that I respond to that because I don't know if that's the, the love impetus that might cause them to change or turn their heart to God or to be reminded that God loves them. Many times it might be just that God loves them, the reminder. But in studying about the life of Terry Harrington, Terry Harrington was a was a, a, a gentleman who grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, uh, about the same age, a couple years older than us. Just I'm just going to give parts of the story. Um, he was an athlete. I was an athlete, and he grew up in a home. It wasn't necessarily Christian like mine, but in the home he grew up in, his you know his parents or his mom was very uh, adamant about him loving people and loving God and so on and so forth. African American. And, uh, (coughs) excuse me, and one day, um, as an athlete, he was, the coach told him, uh, because of some things were going on, he benched him, he benched him. And I I remember, I don't know if you remember this or not, but remember when daddy took my uniform from me (laughs) and told me I couldn't basketball anymore. And basketball, as a 16-year-old, identified who I was. It identified who I was. And so I was, I was good at what I did, and uh, so it hurt me. It, it really hurt me. And anyway, I was eventually restored to that, but moving on to this gentleman's life, he was, and so one night he was out, he, because he had, he had listened to me well, because I hear the Lord saying this, and I don't know if I could communicate it well, and I know I can't do it again, but, but many times the simplest thing, ladies and gentlemen, is the thing that's necessary to say or to do for someone else, not for yourself. Love is never convenient. 
Love is never, it's never going to be easy to love somebody. It's just not. If, if, if it's easy for me to love Dave, I'm, I'm, a, I'm questioning whether or not it's genuine love. I get it. I get it. We have, we have the filial love, you know, as a brotherly love. We've got that, you know, the city of Philadelphia is named after that brotherly love. We get that. But, but I need to get into the love that or he, it cost him something for it to really be beneficial for either one of us. And so this gentleman, uh, Terry Harrington, ended up, uh, he, was, he was at a party one night and he went out um, and, and he, was, he was unaccounted for. Listen to me well. And in being unaccounted for, there was a, there was a robbery, a pretend, uh, uh, attempted robbery that took place in Iowa. And I'm not that familiar with the border, but some of y'all know Council Bluffs in Omaha, you know, are right there at the border, right? The western border of Iowa, is that right? Same in okay. So, so, so the, the robbery took place in Iowa, and when it took place, Terry Harrington was actually in Omaha, but he was accused of being the one who committed the robbery. And in the commission of the robbery, the security guard, who was a, who was a retired policeman, was shot and killed. Okay? And in being shot and killed, yeah, obviously, somebody has to pay for that. Isn't that right? About the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, you know, there's a lot of, there was a lot of racism, a lot of other things going on, you know, uh, societal issues. But in, 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 in that, what happened was he ended up uh, having to bear the brunt of it. People lied on him and said he did it. And he, he knew he didn't. So he spent, he was sentenced to 25 years to life. And, you know, we know that in Iowa, life is life. Okay? And so... I'm just telling you how love works, okay? He did 16 years at Fort Madison. Yeah. Somebody's like, ooh. Yeah. And he said that I had to be, he said, when I went in, I was, I was Tony. But I had to develop another personality to stay in, and I became TJ. That was his alter ego. TJ was hardcore, fight to the death, but Tony was still there, but he didn't know how to access Tony to, to be able to, because TJ had to be the one to function. So in the process of doing that for all those many years, he's, one day his mom and, and his crew drove from Omaha to, uh, his crew, I shouldn't say it like that, his family, drove from Omaha to Fort Madison, which is an eight hour drive. And while they were in the parking lot, they bumped into this lady. And this lady just asked the question, how are you? Who are you? Why are you here? And you know, my son has been, been uh, wrongfully convicted, yada, yada, yada. And she said herself, we hear this all the time, no big deal, come on now, no big deal, I, I get it, okay, but everybody's wrong, wrongfully convicted in prison. And so in the midst of that, she, this, this young lady, she's a Caucasian lady, she's going to the prison because she believes that she's been sent there to make a difference. She's, she, she's not from the Fort Madison area from, of Iowa. She's, she's actually from Kansas City. She senses in her heart she's been sent to make a difference. So she, she goes, and she, although she's more educated than this, she goes to accept a, a position as a groomer, as a barber in the, in the Fort Madison prison. Think about that for a minute. Selfless. And so in, in the prison, she's there. And and she also realizes, she says, you know what, I can't, most, and I'm, I don't mean any political ramifications, or I'm just telling you what she said and what was said in the article. She realized, you know, most of the people whose hair I'm cutting is African American. So I got to go back and learn how to cut their hair. So she goes back selflessly and cuts, and learns how to cut their hair in prison. And one of the first people that sits in her chair is Terry Harrington. And he starts telling his story a little bit, and she asks the question. And in telling his story, she says, do you have a mother or family that drives? Do you see the pieces starting to fall together? He says, yes, you know. And so she begins to listen to him, and she begins to hear him. Many of us listen, but we don't hear. She hears him, and she starts this quest to bring about you know, reverse this injustice into a justice and bring about something who she has no reason to love or help. Now, I would like to say that I saw somewhere in the story that they were Christians. I never saw that. But if an unbeliever or somebody who doesn't profess Christianity can do that, what can we do? 
I'm guilty. I'm guilty. I, I mean, forgive me. I repent. I'm guilty. I've had to learn to go into Walmart with a more sensitive heart. Because if I go in with the, the disdain that I have for that store, and, you know, nothing. I mean, I know some people work there, so, you know, I mean, nothing against it. Then I might miss what God wants me to go to the store for. So the story concludes, and I'm leaving a whole lot out, it doesn't matter, just for sake of time. So she works on a quest, and she's doing all these things. She enlists her brother, who's a lawyer, and all these things. And he goes through all these different things. He's exhausted all his appeals. And then one day, a person takes up his cause that can really affect change in his life. They cut all of that which is which has gone on that has been uh, coercion and manipulation and injustice has been brought to the forefront. And finally, they, the, the governor of we will we will give you clemency and he said I can't take clemency because it admits guilt he said I didn't do anything many people in the world listen to me well many people in the world have not done anything they haven't done anything they deserve what they get no they don't because what they get without Christ in their lives is eternal damnation they don't deserve that well, they did this, they did this, they committed murder. Yeah, but, but, but you don't know the circumstances. You don't know where they're at right now. Are they repentant? Are they sorry? Did they want just somebody to just tell them that they want somebody to tell them that Jesus Christ loved them? Did they just want somebody? And it's easy for us to sit in this church or any other church that might out there, you know, and just, just, just be happy. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm born again. I'm saved. And all these people on their way to a, to a sinner's hell that simply have not known what you know. So somebody like a barber, a, a lady barber, a lady stylist who comes in and takes up a cause that does not bring her anything, didn't bring her any reward, she just did it because she felt like it was right. How much more so can we do? Stand to your feet. That's what love, love means. That's what love does. Love considers not a song. I, I, I look at my wife and... And, and again, I use her as an example because we live together all the time, you know, and I got mad at her the other day. We get mad at each other sometimes. I know some of y'all got these little, you know, very special relationships where y'all don't never get mad at one another, but that ain't reality. And when you wake up from that dream, you will see that, you know what? True love sometimes just has to not consider a suffered wrong. And so in the midst of that, I recognize that if I can't love my brother, who I see every day, but I really love God. And it's easy for me to love him because he, look at him, he looks good, man. Look at, easy for me to ro love Robin because I see her, I know her, we've been friends for a while, but what about the person I don't know? It's more important for me to love them than it is love them. I'm just saying. I'm just saying so if church is going to change and it is it's changing it doesn't matter whether you change or not it really doesn't the only thing about you not changing means that you just get left behind yes. and if you're okay with being left behind God is okay with it too but if you're gonna if you're gonna really affect change as we move into 2019 and beyond because I'm gonna tell you we're already living in eternity then you're gonna have to be willing to do things that just other people won't do. How do I do that, Pastor Tommy? Glad you asked. That by listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, this, this, this morning we've come, we've worshiped in your presence, we've offered you, we've offered you what we've given you. I don't, I don't mean any harm. Please, you guys know me better than this. But if what I've given him hasn't been all of me, then I really haven't given him much at all. If I've just kind of come and sat and felt like, you know, okay, pastor, make me feel good. Praise and worship leader, make me, make me, take me to the throne. Brother or sister sitting next to me, you know, <laughs> acknowledge my existence. Once you know I'm here, that I really haven't given, I've, I've come with a wrong motive. This morning, Father, this afternoon, now in the name of Jesus. Our purpose in coming has been defined not by what we've given as much as who we are. And who we are, God, in our own eyes is in your eyes. 
I pray that you, Father, would just shine upon the hearts of your people, your men and women of God, so that they could see who, how you see them. I want you to show me Tommy, Lord. Don't show me Dave. Don't show me Lynette or Walter. Show me Tommy. Let me see me in your eyes. Let me see how I measure up to what you want and have called me to do. When I see me, when I see the man in the mirror, so to speak, then I can look at others and say, you know what? If not for the grace of God, there go I. So I pray, God, that you would just, by your Holy Spirit, bring a spirit of understanding, of wisdom and revelation to me so that I can see myself and declare myself, am I worthy of all that you've called me to be and to do? And let me show it first by demonstrating love. Help me to love my brothers and sisters. I love these ones in here, God. I really do. I love them. I see them frequently. They sound like me. They act like me. <laughs> God, most of them smell like me. I mean, I get it, Lord. Thank you. But the ones out in the street that don't smell like me, don't look like me, don't sound like me. Let me love them. Let me love them, God. Those that, that, that do more in the realm of the, the negative or in the flesh than I have, than I do. Let me demonstrate my love that way. Like you did for us, that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. So I pray great grace and mercy upon this congregation today. I pray the free flowing favors of the living God upon this congregation today. And I just ask you, Father, to continue to bless us in ways, Lord God, that bring wisdom and revelation to our hearts and you open our mind's eye to see how we can really show forth love. Not what love is not, but what love really is. Let that be our banner and our declaration today. If you agree with that, can you give the Lord a great big shout of praise? Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah.